Welcome to week three of spiritual warfare. I am Apostle Destiny, and this week we are going over the three D's of Satan's strategies. So buckle up, get ready to learn. I pray this blesses you. And remember, the enemy is a one-trick pony. So what began this study? Um, about a year ago, I was asked by somebody, does Satan know our thoughts? Which is why we are instructed to pray quietly um, on certain instances. And the answer, honestly, is no. He's not a mind reader. He's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. However, he does know the thoughts that he places in your mind and waits for you to come into agreement with them. These are intrusive thoughts, thoughts that wouldn't otherwise be yours, and thoughts that do not line up with Yahuwah and what he has called you in your identity with Christ. The verse in question was, Proverbs 18, 20 through 21, which is a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth and with the increase of his lips, he will be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. What he waits for is us to create the curse by coming into agreement with the intrusive thought by the words that we speak out loud and confess with our mouths. So stay tuned and let's figure out how do we defeat the strategies of Satan. The very first thing that Satan and his cohort from hell, demons, principalities, spiritual wickedness, powers, spying spirits, all of the above, how they operate is the very first thing they bring to you is a distraction. So a distraction comes from our deepest desires as a form of temptation. Now, remember, hell roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. That being the case, he has been studying you and studying all of humanity since the fall. Therefore, he knows your temptations. He knows your deepest desires because they're likely generational curses. They're likely things that you inherited from your parents. They're dangerous because they look like a blessing. You've heard the term before, not everything that glitters is gold. Now, while we know that everything good and perfect comes from God, but not everything that's good is God. Let me see if I can make this make more sense. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Remember, Satan is a one-trick pony, so he pulled all of this in the garden, and he's been pulling it ever since. It is designed to keep you in cycles of sin. This is what is known as strongholds. So, Genesis chapter 3, we're going to go to verse 4 through 6. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. There's the distraction right there. He took the deepest desire because... Adam and Eve have been walking with the Father in the cool of the day. They have this bonded relationship, and all they want is to be more like Him in deeper relationship with Him. That is their deepest desire. So the twisting of His words to convince them to eat of the tree of knowledge and good and evil is what looked good because they could be more like their creator. See, they fell into the distraction. They got tempted and were succumbed by it because it looked like a blessing, but it was actually a danger. Temptation causes God to remove covering. The covering is the anointing, his presence from you. And if you do not have the wherewithal 
to pray for his direction first before you make a decision on your temptation, then he does not have to protect you. You see, relationship works both ways. If you turn with me to Mark chapter 4, verse 19, I'll prove it. So Mark 4, verse 19. And the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. The seeds that you allow to take root from temptation and from distraction are what causes the presence, the anointing, the covering to be removed from you. If you remain unrepentant for it. And you'll remain unrepentant as long as you believe in your heart that what you did was good. What you did was to honor him or to seek him deeper. We have very specific things set in place from our creator shown to us by our Savior so that all we have to do is copy, paste, and when we mess up, repent. Because we're human. We're fallible. We have flesh. Mess-ups are bound to happen. So how do we, pre <laughs> how do we prevent these distractions from grabbing a hold of our life and creating that cycle of a stronghold. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Call on God to help you, guide you, and give you a way out. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No man is tempted with more than he can handle. And if you call on Yahuwah, he is faithful to give you an escape. This is ready. Now, I want you to take notes every time I give that number and say what that means because there is a beautiful picture at the end of this. So the first thing we do is get ready. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The second thing we do, Hebrews 12, 2, we get set. We fix our eyes on Jesus. Let's go to Hebrews 12, 2. Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for who the joy was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we get ready. We call on God for an escape. We get set. We focus our eyes on our Savior. And lastly, we aim. How do we aim? Colossians chapter 3. Verses 1 and 2. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not the things of the earth. So we aim, you get ready, call for an escape, you set your eyes on Jesus, and you aim for the things of heaven. This is how we defeat distractions. We cannot keep the enemy from sending distractions, from sending temptations. That is going to happen no matter how strong your walk is. But we can prevent it from creating a stronghold in our life when we remember to ready, set, aim. But what happens if we fall 
to the distraction. When Satan cannot succeed in distracting you, he then proceeds to try and discourage you. Job 2.3b, although you, Satan, moved me, Yahuwah, against him, Job, without cause, it's a false accusation. Discouragement comes in two forms, false accusations and shame. False accusations, again, back to Genesis. We're going to go to Genesis 3.12. And the man said, The woman whom you gavest to be with me, she gave of me the tree, and I did eat. Now, Adam was speaking the false accusation against the father. But we fight not with flesh and blood. It was Satan who was moving behind him to speak. And that false accusation removed from him accountability and responsibility. He let go of what was his to have, which is accountability and was responsibility as the head, the spiritual leader. He brought false accusation against the father and against his wife because he would not take accountability for what was already taking place. Zechariah 3 verse 1. Zechariah 3 verse 1, we see Joshua in the throne room at judgment with Yeshua, our mediator, and Satan, our accuser, standing, bringing judgment against Joshua, the high priest. And so the father says to Satan, I rebuke you. I chose Jerusalem. I rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked out of the fire? Satan stood at his right hand, ready to resist him, bring false accusations. Romans 8, 33 Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Satan leads false accusations against the elect. Shame. Shame comes in two forms. The first being backsliding. So backsliding is what happens when distraction worked and you fell into that temptation. Genesis 3 verse 1. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden? <clears throat> he comes to gauge your knowledge of what the Father has said of the word. That's how we defeat him with the word. When you don't have a strong foundation in scripture and what the father says about you and the father says about his purpose and his ways and what he desires of you, then you are a house that is built on sand, easily swayed. That is how Satan wins. He doesn't come to you with complete lies. He comes to you with twisted truth. And then the second way that shame can take root in discouragement is unhealed trauma from your testimony. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it. For your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant to his devices. You have unhealed trauma because of unforgiveness. And we'll get to that momentarily. So I want to look at false accusations and backsliding right now. So backsliding is what happens because distraction works. So now you're in a cycle that led to discouragement, shame, and guilt. So the natural progression from distraction is discouragement, 
when you fail to prevent or overcome the distraction. But discouragement comes when you do prevent the distraction. That discouragement is false accusation or reminding you of unhealed trauma. So how do we overcome discouragement? We overcome it first and foremost by Revelation 12, 11, for we overcome by the words of our testimony and the blood of the lamb. However, for our testimony to hold the power to overcome with the authority we have in Yeshua, we have to be healed and bold in it. Our testimony is our training ground for the calling and the anointing that is placed on our lives. And I'm going to speak from a very real place. I, as a child, was molested by my uncle. I, still as a child, was not quite 18 yet, was raped by my fiance. And every person in between there was some form of physical, verbal, mental, sexual assault that took place on me in my life. Because up until that point where I was raped, I had unhealed trauma. Not only was I not forgiving those people for harming me, it's easier said than done. I'm speaking from experience. I get it. But I also was refusing to forgive myself for blaming myself and refused to forgive myself for stepping outside of the Father's protection. That's not victim blaming. This is an honest reflection. Evil comes to you and will have victory over you when you remove yourself from his covering and his protection. I have Psalms 37, Psalms 94, Psalms 91. We need his covering and his protection for victory in all things. But because I healed and forgave my attackers, because I healed and forgave my younger self for not knowing better, for not realizing it wasn't my fault, when I forgave, my testimony no longer had power over me to cause shame. It is now a light in the darkness that says, I have victory in Yeshua, the blood of the lamb, and my testimony will lead many to the Father, to salvation, because there is a light at the end of this dark tunnel. I did not kill myself because somebody showed me the light and now I come to you. I show you the light. There is forgiveness. There is hope. Our testimony is hope. But not if we are afraid to talk about it. Not if we are afraid to show that before we fully surrendered to Jesus Christ and gave our lives to the Father, we had a past. We had trauma. And yes, your trauma can come from you not forgiving yourself for doing a bad thing. All who come to the Father in repentance and call on Jesus as their Savior will be saved. It doesn't matter what you've been through and what you've done and who you've done. It matters that you come and you turn. Your testimony can only lead somebody to that place when you have healing when it becomes battle-tested armor for you. Forgiveness is key. And that's why it is the most spoken about subject in all of scripture. Forgiveness is key. 70 times 7 times a day. Now, 
Forgiveness does not mean get rid of your boundaries, but it means to let go of the poison that's killing you and doing absolutely nothing to them. Let God handle them because unforgiveness, holding unforgiveness is taking vengeance into your own hands. And vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. We overcome false accusations by zeroing in and remembering our peace, Romans 16, 20. We maintain our sound mind, 1 Timothy 1, 7, for I did not give you a spirit of fear, but of power of love and a sound mind by way of aiming properly to heaven. And we remember that conviction is not condemnation. Conviction is for your growth, Romans 8, 1. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? That means that if you feel a gut punch and something twisting that's spoken to you and your savior is Jesus Christ, that is not condemnation. That is conviction from the Holy Spirit saying, hey, this is something I've been trying to work on you with. So yeah, it feels like a twisting in your gut and it sucks. It does. Hebrews 12, 11 Nobody likes conviction, correction, discipline. But it is for the good of your tree to bear fruit later. Now, John 3, 17 and 18. If you are not in Christ Jesus and you are not a believer, that same gut punch is condemnation for your lack of belief has condemned yourself. Conviction is for our growth when Jesus is our Savior and our Lord. He's not just somebody who pulled us from the fire, but he is somebody who is reigning over our lives. And every step we take is to please him and to please the Father and to honor the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's what conviction is for. So you zero in to remember your peace, maintain a sound mind, and remember that conviction is for your growth. This is how you overcome a false accusation. How do you overcome shame? You be sure. How can you be sure? You test yourself before Satan does. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself lest you drink damnation on yourself. Yes, this conversation is in context talking about communion. Because when you take communion, you are accepting the gospel. That Jesus is your bread of life and the wine of your new covenant. And when you take communion and you don't agree with the gospel, you don't get to stand at judgment day and say you never heard it. That is drinking damnation on yourself. But also when you do not examine yourself, you do not inwardly reflect and heed conviction. That is when Genesis 3, 1, Satan shows up to gauge your knowledge of the word and gauge your knowledge of the truth. And twist it into a cycle of backsliding. Test yourself before the enemy tests you. And the second way we be sure how we get over the trauma in our testimony is we forgive our past. 2 Corinthians 2, 17. For we are not as many which are corrupt in the word of God. But as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Don't corrupt your testimony. Don't corrupt your words by twisting scripture and twisting what happened to you. So maybe you look a little bit better. If your testimony was you were a garbage person, own it. Because the redemptive and transformative power of Christ is you are no longer a garbage person. Forgive your past and be sure. If and when we ready, set, aim, 
against our distractions, then we can zero in on our target and the target is overcoming discouragement and we can be sure of where the center, the narrow way of the mark is located. Ready, set, aim, zero in, be sure. But what happens if A, you continue in that cycle of backsliding or B, you just overcame discouragement. Distraction, discouragement, downright sin. The last stop on the ever increasing attacks is downright sin. What is downright sin? It is complete disobedience. It is lawlessness. If he cannot stop you or pull you back, Satan will push you and press you out of grace and anointing. Genesis 3, 7 through 9. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. It's their shame of their sin. So now they're pushed. Now that they get pressed, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now they are pressed. They have been pushed to cover themselves. They have been pressed to hide from the presence and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And now he is missing from grace. Anything that exalts itself above the knowledge of Yahuwah, the knowledge being the scriptures that we have, and our knowledge being our experience of him and the words he speaks to us, that is disobedience and downright sin, earthly knowledge, flesh desires, pride and vainglory, traditions of men. 2 Corinthians 10.5 So turn with me to James chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not, because you ask not. You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it, upon your lusts, your own selfish desires. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of this world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of Yahuwah. Do you think that the scripture says in vain that the spirit that dwells in you lusts to envy but he gives more grace wherefore he said God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble submit yourselves therefore to God resist the devil and he will flee from you draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you cleanse your hands you sinners purify your hearts you double minded be afflicted and mourn and weep praying and fasting. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into heaviness. Be fully repentant for the way you've been living your life. Humble yourselves in the sight of Yahuwah and he will lift you up. Speak not evil of one another, brethren. 
He that speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you that judges another? Brothers and sisters, when you act in complete lawlessness, when you destroy what the Father has spoken because of your own desires and your own vainglory and your own twisting of Scripture, you fall into disobedience because you have been pressed, you have been pulled back, and you have been pushed out of your grace and out of your anointing and out of His presence. What happens when we don't humble ourselves to the Father? What happens when we do not fast and pray and be in full repentance? What happens when we choose the traditions of men and things of this world, even while still trying to have things of God? This is a dangerous place. And I think the timing of this couldn't be any more perfect because we just came off of a holiday that is considered traditions of this world, traditions of men, other people. When you come into agreement with things of this world, you make of yourself an enemy of heaven. It's no light matter. And you only get to this place when you have continually fallen to temptation and continually, continually fallen to the backsliding, refusing to give forgiveness. And now you are in complete disobedience because you refuse to acknowledge your own shame, your own shortcomings, and you hide yourself from his presence And then ask, where has he been? The question is, where have you been? Because he's still right where you left him, waiting. So what happens when we don't overcome, like James 4, 1 through 12? James 4, 1 through 12 told us what makes you an enemy and how to overcome it. So what happens when we do not overcome the disobedience in the ways of this world. And I am saying this confidently, not to chastise you, not to come against you. I'm saying this because this passage of scripture is written directly to those who believe in Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. It is not written to unbelievers. And this passage too much has been used to bring harm and judgment to unbelievers. Romans 1, 26 through 32 is what happens to you believers when you refuse to humble yourselves before the Lord and fully repent and give up the ways of this world. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change their natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust toward one another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their own error, which was their substance. Even as they did not like to retain Yahuwah in their knowledge, Yahuwah gave them over to a reprobate mind, gave them over to who they were before they believed. To do those things which are not convenient. It is not convenient to be disobedient and to be apart from the presence of God when you are a believer. This is Paul. 
Paul, whom you all praise for the father of hyper grace. No. This is to believers, verse 29, being filled with unrighteousness and fornication and wickedness and covetousness and maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers. That means gossipers. And yes, if you have unforgiveness and hate towards anyone, Jesus said you have already murdered him. Because when you have unforgiveness and hate in your heart, you don't care if somebody dies and goes to hell. That's murder. That's murder on the soul. 30, back, back, backbiters, I mean, betraying each other, haters of Yahuwah, haters of his ways and what he wrote down for those who were supposed to be believers, despiteful and proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, Covenant breakers, adulterers and adulteresses. You broke your marriage covenant. Without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, lacking in giving somebody else grace that you've been given. Who knowing the judgment of Yahuwah, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do the same. Worthy of death is the sin of, is the law of sin and death. For the wages of sin is death. Everything that was just listed is sin. That payment is death. When you act in these ways, when you act disobedient, when you act in the lawlessness continually and unrepentantly, meaning you're not even trying to go back to the ways of the Father. You're not even trying to walk in the covenant that has been placed before you. You pay for your own sin. And you might as well have nailed Christ to the cross yet again. Romans 1, 26 through 32 is for us believers who claim the name of Jesus Christ over our lives. But walk in disobedience. Purposefully. Hear me. Purposefully. So how do you overcome disobedience? How do you overcome downright sin when you've already failed to distractions, when you've already failed by backsliding? And how do you overcome the temptation of disobedience when you have overcome distraction and you have overcome discouragement? Amen and to Tetelestai. You first have to believe in Yahuwah's instruction over your life. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, lean not unto your own understanding, but in all your ways, pray and seek the Father that he may make your path straight. And believe in your victory through him. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. The word amen, amen, means so be it. It ends your prayer in authority and it comes from the word aman, which means to be firm, established, and believe. To believe in something enough that you claim it is to have actionable moments that follow your words. If your words and your actions do not line up, your faith is dead, James 2, 17. And you are the hypocritical Pharisees that Jesus called out. You give me praises with your lips, but you defy me in your actions. It is clinging symbols in heaven. Believe. Amen. The second way you overcome disobedience is you do not doubt that the Father is holding you. Isaiah 
41.10. He is making your crooked paths straight. Isaiah 45.2. Trust his word will not return to him void. Isaiah 55.11. And he is faithful to complete the work that he started in you. Philippians 1.6. Tetelestai. To tell us die, as we are told, means it is finished, but it comes from four different root words that mean fulfill, make perfect, mature, complete, and accomplished. How do you overcome the strategies of Satan? You get ready, you get set, and you aim. This is where the divine, write the word divine next to that third thing, those three make it divine actions begin to take place in your life when you zero in and you be sure that divine pulls you into grace. Five is grace. Then you amen, believe, and tell us that it is finished. Now you have victory. The divine brought you into grace and victory. This is how you overcome the strategies of Satan, not by yourself, but by scripture and by implementing scripture into your life by the design of Yahuwah through the blood of Yeshua, who is our mediator, our high priest and our king of kings by the guidance and the conviction and the leading and the teaching of the Ruach, the Holy Spirit. Do not be ignorant to Satan's devices. You hold the victory in your decisions and choices. The Father is waiting on you to give you everything because he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. But if you fall and stay in and remain in the cycles of strongholds given to you by the enemy who does nothing but want to steal your purpose and kill your anointing and destroy everything about you. Then you cannot walk in that life that he came to give you more abundantly. Seek after him and his righteousness. Focus. Call on him to give you an escape. Focus on Jesus. Aim towards heaven. Zero in on your patience and your peace. Be sure of yourself and your knowledge of who he is. Test yourself. Believe and what's already been done for you and just copy paste and understand that it's finished and it will be finished as long as you as the other person in this relationship between you and the father as long as you continue to maintain your faith in him and what has been set out for you I know today was a tough one I had to come firm on a lot of things. And a lot of things are stuff that had to be brought firm to me too. But it wasn't until that firmness was brought to me and that conviction of somebody else wanting nothing more than heaven and everything heaven has to offer for me that I finally understood what I was doing by giving in to temptation and by continually backsliding and just being disobedient. I ran from my calling for too long. I led people astray for too long. That is a heavy weight as a pastor. I myself was stuck in these stuck in these cycles, stuck in these strongholds. Stuck in downright sin and disobedience. Because my own pride would not let me go. Sometimes things have to be said firmly. Sometimes tables have to be flipped spiritually. Get thee behind us, Satan, for our victory is in Yeshua and our testimony of what he has brought us out of. Join me next week as we understand the hierarchy of hell 
and begin to fully unravel the devices of the enemy and walk fully and uprightly in spiritual warfare in our victory. Have an amazing week. Go out, be transformed, be redeemed, and begin to walk in your victory.